<laughs> Hallelujah! Glory! You ready for the explosion? Let it explode! to God. We bring under divine law and order everything that's said and done. And Satan, you have no part. Get out. <laughs> we are the delivered ones and we know it. And you are the bound one and you're going to find it out. Hallelujah. I loose you that are blind right now. Your spirit of blindness, come out! Yes. Got your eye open. Now. Now, I said. Yes. Call out of a heart. <laughs> the hundreds of pains got scared and left. <laughs> They're all gone, leaving out of your body. The great physician. <laughs> Jesus is his name. By his stripes you are healed. I command every organ in your body to straighten up and straighten out right now. Receive. Receive now. Receive now. The power of God. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Bless brother and sister Doherty, their workers in this place. Satan, keep your hand off. The blessing must flow big and wide and deep. Hallelujah. You demon spirits of confusion, get clear out of town. <laughs> Let the people think purely in the Holy yes. Ghost. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Just let the Lord heal you. His presence is all over the place. You should close your eyes so you don't get it detracted by something else around you. Close yourself in in a cubicle with Jesus there. Shalabakai. If you've never spoken in tongues, start speaking right now. Come on. Hallelujah. Receive the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Ghost. Speak it out. Speak it out. Speak it out. Halarabaka. Yeah. In Jesus. In Jesus. Satan, take your hand off this nation. You and all your witchcraft, your demonology, we preserve this nation until the rapture. You can have the thing then. But we're going to preserve this thing until the Lord says, come on up here. You fought a good fight. You finished your course. You've kept the faith. <laughs> come on, laugh unto the Lord, everybody. <laughs> well, hallelujah! Ah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look pretty tonight. <laughs> hallelujah. Tell my wife how pretty she looks. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless you. Bless you. You may be seated. I have with us tonight my wife, then my girlfriend for 47 years. Next month, we're 48. We've decided to take on 47 more. Don't ever lose a good thing. 
And uh, we thank the Lord for two of our sons. We have three sons and two of them are in this building with us tonight. Our son Peter is in charge of our local television ministry here, Channel 47. And my son Frank is co pastoring with us in the city of South Bend. We're delighted that they are come along to see you too. Uh, the Lord bless you. Now, if you don't think there's a mean devil, let me tell you something. Six weeks ago, the boat that has come under our direction for the rest of my life, named Spirit, pulled out of the Los Angeles Harbor. We put 200,000 gallons of fuel on it so it wouldn't break down halfway over there. And uh, went through the Panama Canal and then went way up the the Atlantic Ocean, from one side of it to the other. Went through the Kiel Canal last week, and last Sunday pulled into the USSR on Sunday. On Sunday. Well, that's when they had the revolution last Sunday. The devil did that on purpose. He's scared of us, you know. Why didn't they do it some other day? Why'd they have to wait? We were, six, we were six weeks at sea. Why did they have to wait until we were in the harbor to destroy their own government and, and uh, start in on this? We've already paid for an auditorium seating 23,000 people. And uh, I'm going to go there next week. See what we can do. In Jesus' name. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we lost contact with our boat yesterday. We have, uh, we have ham radio that we can be in contact with it all day, every day, all night. And, and so uh, we, the, the government closed down our radio station on the boat. They closed down all telephone operations. We tried to get into the country through Finland. We tried to get in through Norway. We tried to get in through Sweden. We tried every way to get in into the country, and they closed, they closed down the communication uh, completely. And so uh, we have about $8 million worth of food and clothing and medical supplies there. And uh, uh, we're going to give it to the people. I don't think they'll do anything about it, but let us distribute it because uh, the country is in terrible shape, food-wise and clothing-wise. And medical supplies worse than that. And, and so uh, I don't think they will do anything about it, but treat us nice is what we're expecting. Uh, when we finish there, we're going to reload that ship uh, in northern Europe, and we're going to Albania. Those people are dying down there. And uh, we're, we're taking, we are taking with us uh, uh, 14 tons of, uh, of milk for babies. I think we can feed more than four babies and give them a ton apiece. <laughs> we don't want the little babies to die. They're the ones that die first. So we're taking, uh, we bought this milk in, uh, in Copenhagen <clears throat> and uh, we, we're, we're, uh, we're glad to uh, take it. We were going to take it into Russia, but we're already in Russia now and we have so much stuff for them. How many of you ladies have gone to the store and you have bought one of these things they call a cup of soup? Have you? We got a million of them. <laughs> We're going to feed them and feed them and feed them and feed them and feed them. And, and so it's going to be a lot of fun, praise God. And, and so we're looking forward to it. We've given many millions of dollars in the last two years to the USSR. In Romania, we took in a million two hundred thousand dollars worth of food and medical supplies to that nation. In Bulgaria, we took in over a million dollars worth of food and supplies to that nation. The president fell in love with us. He just hugs me every time he can get close enough to me, and, and says, "I'm so glad you love me." He says, "I feel your love," and I said, "Yeah, that's the Jesus in me getting into you." <laughs> and uh, we're, we're very, very feeling there. And uh, everybody's been so nice to us. We were taking food into Poland and the, and, and, and the government of Sweden got so happy about it 
they gave us six million kroner, which is a million dollars. You can take in more money if you got a million than you can if you have less than a million. How many already knew that? <laughs> you look like you knew all about that. And uh, we can't tell anybody, so don't you tell anybody. <laughs> Kellogg Corn Flakes has given us as much corn flakes as you could put in this whole building. Can, 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 can you tell us, Brother Ken, how much cornflakes we're getting? We've got 39,640 cases. That's cases. That's, you know, 10 or 12 of those big boxes in each case. And these are big boxes like this. They sell from between 3 and $5 down at the store. And uh, we, we're, they said, do you want it? And I said, want it. <laughs> 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 oh, I tell you, I tell you, we, we want it. The Lord's getting so good we don't know what to do with all of it. That's that. <laughs> and then the wonderful way to be. Yeah. We are just doing so many wonderful things. Up at our church we have a whole hospital, a uh, 17 room hospital, and everything from gauze up and down is in there, two million dollars worth of stuff. And we're just saying, Lord, what city should we put it in out there in that third world? And uh, we're ready to ship it any day. Uh, some doctors in Indiana uh, gave it to us, and they're willing to go over and set it up too. After it's in big boxes right now, and uh, we're ready to go over. But uh, you let too much good stuff come to you from all different directions. You don't know which way to go first. You may go up, <laughs> and you need to stay down here to get all this stuff distributed. The Lord has told me that there was going to be enough of everything until the rapture. There's going to be enough oil. There's going to be enough gas. There's going to the whole earth is going to produce until the rapture. The devil will have to help the Antichrist. We're not going to do a thing for him. Uh, we've been to Russia. We've put many millions of dollars into the USSR. We, uh, we have our own church in Siberia. Uh, we we, we, we paid for the building, and we paid for the ground. And a few days ago, they had a revival. 35,000 people saved. And so, uh, they, they had church on Sunday from 6 in the morning to 8 or 9 at night. On Sunday night, they can't get them all through there. When I first began to work with those people, they had 50. How many glad I went on out there? Now, you see... A real good big shot couldn't have done that. He'd have lost his reputation to go to a place that only had 50. But you see, they had 800 before I left town. That was their starter. And, and now they got 35,000. That ain't bad, you know. It's a good sized congregation. Hallelujah. In a few days, we are going to Portugal. I wish you had that pretty little. God's got some of the prettiest pictures in the world, you know. They're just really handsome. He's a little fellow about this big. Portugal has never had a revival in history, you know. They missed the Luther revival, they missed the Western, they missed it all, you know. And this young man goes walking in there, into that, in that capital city. And last year when I was there, he already had 34,000 members Lord in his God. church. So I'm going back again next month for their annual convention and see how many more thousands. It'll be 40,000 for sure. You, if I were to tell you, tell you all the things they'd do in that city, it'd take a whole night uh, just, just to tell you. While you're messing around watching television, that man marches his choir and his band into an enormous plaza, you know, at uh, 12 noon. They sing for half an hour and say, he's coming. Everybody says, who's coming? They said, wait and see. And so they sing for another half an hour and rejoice. And here come the thousands of people to hear the choir sing and the, and the band play. And then they say, he's coming real soon. They say, well, who, who's coming real soon? So everybody says, we don't know. We have to stay seated. And so in another half an hour, they, they sing and they play until there are thousands of people around them now listening to these young people play and sing. And about two hours after they start, here comes this young man. He doesn't look over you know, 26 or 7, but he must be about 32 or 3. And uh, he opens that Bible, 
It begins in John 3, 16. Points a finger out there and says, the whole mess of you are going to hell. And now is your opportunity to change and go to heaven. And he preaches for about 20 minutes and says, if you're ready to get saved, get on your knees. And you'll see the strangest plaza you ever saw in a beautiful capital city. There are thousands of people on their knees. And he starts leading them in the sinner's prayer for about 30 minutes, going over it and over it and over it until he's sure they got it. <laughs> then they stand up and he says, you only got half of it. Ready for the other half? And they all say yes. He reads them, he reads them Acts chapter 2. <laughs> Raises his hand and says, receive the Holy Ghost. And they start falling left and right and back and front. And you look out there and the whole park is just messed up. By that time, by that time, uh, 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 about 500 of its workers were there, and they take every name and every address of every one of them, and in 48 hours, they're visited. They're visited. See, he's not playing games. He's playing church, you see. Yeah, he's not playing games. On a Sunday afternoon, I was there last year for the convention. I think I'm the only speaker we ever let in. And I asked him why, and he said, well, I preach all of your material, so I better let you come preach for me. <laughs> I said, well, that's okay. And, and uh, he, he had the bull ring, you know, where the bulls fight humans. Humans fight bulls. It's kind of crazy, but anyway, that's what they do. It's, it's almost as bad as football. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the bull ring was full. It had over 18,000 people in it. And then there were hundreds standing around the top. I says, going to get a lot of souls saved here, man. This looks great. Old sober face said, nobody saved. What do you mean? I said, but look at all these people, man. We're going to, ooh, 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 going to get a lot of people saved. He said, not going to get anybody saved. What do you mean? Well, I said, look at all those people. Oh, he said, these are my church workers. He said, I've come here to give them three hours of instruction. He said, you couldn't get in here without a ticket. He says, every one of these people have a ticket for my church. And I brought them here for three hours of instruction. Now, now, there are places in the world where they're doing something. And, and we were saying, Lord, send it. And the Lord said, go get it. You know? Go get it. And, and uh, it's good to be alive. I'm mean, glad you're alive. It's good. It's good to be alive. All over the face of this earth. I was trying to write down here a few moments ago where we've been this just this year, almost all over the world this year, all through the Orient, uh, preaching all through Europe and parts of Africa. And uh, it's been a wonderful year for seeing so many people saved and blessed. And the Lord has said that if we would take a desperate nation that's dying of famine and give that food to the churches, that the ungodly will come to the church and say, how'd you get the food? In the altar, man. And we lead them to Christ at the altar. We baptize them in water. They receive the Holy Ghost. And we give them all the food they want to eat. That we'll see the greatest revival humanity has ever seen. Yeah. 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 That's what Jesus did. After all, you're just walking the first steps of Jesus. He fed the hungry. And he became known everywhere because he fed the hungry. And our pastor read to us tonight that he receives it as from himself if you give it to somebody. Aren't you glad we can help people? Yes. Praise God. God. God richly bless you. Praise God. Uh, up on the little table, and there's a lot of other nice little tables up there too. Uh, you go by and you got any leftover stuff at our table. I'd like you to go to the Holy Land with us. We go every November. Uh, we we uh, I'd like for you to go this year. This is a prophetic year. And so uh, pick up a folder and go with us. It's the first week in November. That's the same time we go every year. Uh, this is a new book that just came off the press. Time Bomb in the Middle East by the Harrison House here in the city. And you want to be sure and get your copy of it tonight. In the last few days, a book called Exorcism came off the press. It's my last book. No, it's just the last one for right now. <laughs> we, got, 
I think I got two or three at the printer's note at this moment. Uh, but uh, actually, says, I wouldn't have got a hold of that whole subject. And so uh, there it is. Uh, it, it sells for $9, dollars eight ninety five. We don't have it in nickel, so we take nine. Uh, <laughs> we have three tapes on the other side, and, and that, that is on exorcism, how you can handle the thing yourself. In, in the middle is a special book, and I'm sorry they're stuck in the middle, but it's in the middle. I can't get through it here. Uh, why do people kill people that they don't know? Can you imagine that man that they were talking about in the paper today that said he's killed at least 60 people? Can you imagine the young man in Milwaukee cutting out the heart, putting it in the ice box, and cooking it and eating it? You see? This is in America. We have a book called... This one booked... Unprovoked murder. You don't know them. You've never seen them. You don't know their name. You just kill them. Uh, we're going to give you that book free tonight. And the other two are at a reduction. It's just $20 for all of it. So go back and be sure and get yours tonight. Uh, we need to understand things that are happening around us. God don't want us to be ignorant. Uh, I appeared in court in Chicago. Uh, and had to give, give uh, uh, testimony to the judge that there was a devil. And they put it in their records in their law books in Chicago. That devil does possess humans. And that, that human can become demonized. It's strange that in America you have to go to court to tell that, you know. But the man had killed two people. And he claimed he was demon possessed. And it was a very strange case. Uh, and uh, he said he should be set free because he was demon possessed. You heard the old slogan, the devil made me do it. He was playing that game, but the judge was smarter. He's still in jail. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Good to see you, everybody. The Lord bless you. We got back from Europe last Saturday. And uh, we were in Germany this time. Now, I don't have, you know, four or five hours to do this. I'd like to, but I don't quite have that long. But uh, uh, there are three prophetic spots in the world. One is Russia. Now, don't get too upset about what's happening because this is prophetic, what's happening up there. There has to be this military power to come against Israel to fulfill Ezekiel 38 and 39. And, and so what's happening up there is right straight down the prophetic area. So... Uh, uh, don't get scared about it. It'll be all right. And the other is the common market. We had our big giant plane, you know, the, the, the big Hercules, all over Europe. We, we, we were with the uh, Kurds for six weeks feeding the Kurds with that giant plane. And uh, when we got our bills from Europe, our bills were in Euro dollars. And they hadn't printed them yet. And they hadn't circulated them yet. And, and the euro dollar is worth $1.10 of American money. And we had to pay our bills for, fu for fuel and things like that in euro dollars. They want to get to 92 so bad they don't know what to do. And, and the, in 92, they will, they will have the largest group of people in the history of the world who voluntarily used one currency. Dictators have made people do it, but they're going to do it voluntarily. We're coming to the time of the Antichrist very dramatically, very dramatically. Now, I, I keep going back over, over to Europe because uh, reading about it, hearing about it, it doesn't go deep enough inside if you're a preacher. You have to feel it. You have to get with it, you know. So uh, about every month, uh, we go, and sometimes twice a month, uh, we go and preach in, in the different countries of Europe. And, and uh, we go across the Atlantic so, cause, so, so many times until even the stewardess says, uh, glad to see you again. <laughs> you say, what do you say? I just hate that travel. But, but if you're going to get to the people, you have to go. You, you, you can't get to them in a rocking chair. 
a rocking chair has a lot of action. It just don't go anywhere. Yeah. In Hebrews 12 and 1, it says, Now faith is. What is faith? A better word for a faith uh, is trust. I think you can understand it. Uh, we so sort of use that little word faith until it's like a dish rag. It'll go anywhere. And, but trust. If you say, how much faith do I have? How much trust do you have? What is faith? I noticed you getting up and down here a little bit ago. <laughs> and I didn't see one of you sit down slow. If that seat had been made of cardboard, you would. You say, why did I sit down hard? Because you saw the steel legs under there. And, and, and why would you sit down hard? Experience. What is faith? Experience. Yes. Yeah. Faith is experience. Faith is not magic. Faith is a life you live. Yes. And the reason so many people know so little about it you think it's magic and you're saying, give me faith, give me faith. God's saying, shut up, shut up. <laughs> because you don't know what you're talking about. You know. You say, Smith Wigglesworth had faith. He had a lot more than that, honey. He jumped out of bed about 7 o'clock in the morning and danced before the Lord for about 10 or 15 minutes. Praising and magnifying God, you see. He didn't need an aspirin to get up and two to go to bed. Are you here? Yeah. Faith is a life that you live. And, and if you want faith to function in you, it, it is an act. It's not a dream, not a hope. It's an act that you perform. Faith can be so embedded inside of you until you make faith acts spontaneously. Yes. In fact, I've never seen faith that was nervous. When Paul said, settle down, everybody, have a little food, everybody's safe, <laughs> they were still holding on to those deck poles, and that old ship was chugging high and low, and they didn't know whether they were going to make it or not. He was the only one that had faith, because faith is never nervous. You don't have faith. <laughs> no, you have faith. Faith revealed through your eyes, a look of faith. Unbelief has its own look. Faith, faith is something that the way you walk, you know, you got it or you don't have it. Unbelief and doubt and depression gets into your feet even. Must less your eyes, causes some of you men to lose your hair. Well, now, excuse me. <laughs> When I was 17 years old, as the pastor said, I left my hometown in Panama City, Florida to go out in evangelistic work. There were two things I didn't like. I didn't like churches and didn't like preachers. <laughs> so I stayed away from them. I went out in the country, there's a schoolhouse. I swept the floor with my, myself. I had a little handbill printed, paid for it and delivered it. Free, free of charge to the people, and, and started a revival meeting. <laughs> I wasn't an exhorter, I was an exhauster. <laughs> it was pitiful, you know. But when I left home, I had 65 cents in the world. World. Did you know I didn't realize that? Till I counted my money after I got into, into, into the revival meeting. I said, I, I started up here with 65 cents. And I got some bills to pay. Got to find a way to pay those bills. Did you know that I didn't worry about my 65 cents? And you know most people say, yeah, I'm going to go out in the ministry, you know. I'm waiting for God to, honey, you're going to die where you're sitting. 
God does not respond. Faith is an act. It's a spontaneous act. You do it, you do it without calculating. Can I do it? Can I make it? <laughs> the Lord didn't do that on this building here. He just started building the thing, said, money, get over here in a hurry. <laughs> Those new buildings that Brother Billy Joe's building up here. He didn't wait until he got all the money. He said, come on, folks, let's walk together and pay for it in cash. You know, that must have made the devil mad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he don't like things like that. But faith is an act. And, and when, you, uh, when it comes spontaneously, you're living in faith. Yes. Now, the devil don't want you to know that. He wants you to always say, oh, God, give me faith. You wouldn't know what it was you had. It. You wouldn't know what to do with it. Because faith is a life that you live. It, it's a, it, it just flows fr fr from you. I had to be told by somebody, said, did you know you had faith? I said, do it, do it, really? I didn't know it. If you'd have asked me how I was living, I could tell you that. But I, I didn't realize that it was a faith motivation that was inside. I preached for a whole week to those farmers. No, I wouldn't call it preaching, really. <laughs> I would say to those farmers, I want you to know I don't like you. And to tell you the truth, you stink. I was born in New Orleans, where we have Madison Avenue from New York. And we know how to cook, we know how to eat, and we know how to dress. You don't know, know any of it at all. And the only reason I'm here is because I was dying of tuberculosis. And God said if I would preach, I could live. Thank you for being here. Somebody's got to help me live. God bless the farmers. Fortunately, they enjoyed that. Nobody had ever told them that before. After being there for a week, I said, now let me see. You know, uh, there has to be some money in this deal. When I went to church, I sat on the back seat and looked at the girls all the time, and I didn't know what went on really. And, and uh, so, I said, now let me see, how did they do that? They did pass some plates or something around. At least on Sunday morning they did. I said, if I don't do that, I'm going to starve for sure. So after being there for a week, how many ever heard that phrase, pass the hat? Yeah, that's what we used to do. We'd borrow a hat. So I said, anybody loan me a hat? And an old farmer handed me his. They looked like the horse had bitten off about half of it on this side. And we took that old old beaten down hat. We passed it around. And you know, as soon as we got through, you know what he said? Give me my hat. <laughs> as if he was going to lose something, you know. We had an altar out in front and I spilt the offering over onto the altar. And I, I counted it out loud during church. One, two. These were all pennies. There wasn't a single nickel in the offering. There wasn't a single dime in the offering. I was 17 years old and brokenhearted. I said, I don't believe I can live on that. <laughs> then I got mad. I said, any of you farmers got any chickens? Everybody raised a hand. I said, we'll put a coop outside, and I don't mean maybe you bring chickens tomorrow night. Brother, if you don't have dollars, if you got chickens, it's all the same. I said, anybody got the pigs? Every hand went up. This was during the Depression. This was 1930. And, and uh, I said, we'll have a coop on this side for pigs. I don't mean maybe bring pigs tomorrow night. You should have been there the next night. We couldn't have church. We had so many chickens cackling. We had so many pigs groaning. The pigs knew they were going to make a sacrifice. And the chickens knew that it was only an offering they were going to give. I gave it all to a farmer and he took it, he, he took it to the market the next day, the wholesale market, add more money than any preacher in 50 miles. 
You know, just because you're 17, you don't have to be dumb. You say, was that faith? I haven't qualified that one yet. I just know in about six or seven months, I brought a brand new Ford for $485. So you don't have to be poor, even in the depression. You know, everybody was saying, oh, it's a depression, depression. But man, you're just in the wrong place. You get out in the country where they got plenty of produce and there's no depression out there. That's just depression downtown where those poor folks live. <laughs> we may all go back to the farm soon. Well, this went on uh, for three years and I had a good time. When I was 20 years old, God told me that I had to go and preach overseas. So I said, well, uh, all right. I don't want to. I don't like these people, much less those. <laughs> I really want to go home. That's what I want to do. The Lord said, you've got to go to the mission field. So I went to San Francisco. And when I went to get on the boat, I had $12 in the world. Now, I had preached in San Francisco at Glad Tidings for three nights before, before I left the next day. And Dr. Craig had been there on the platform every night, and I'd preach. Souls got saved every night. I took the youth out of Bible college. I took the youth on the street for a street meeting before the service to show them how to do street meetings because a country preacher knows how to hold street meetings. And so uh, I listened pretty carefully to what pastors say, you know. And during those three nights, I noticed he never mentioned my name during the offering, and I got the idea that I wasn't going to get any. And I was right, you know. Now, he knew I was going off around the world, and he had a big church. Dr. Charles Price had been there. Amos Simple McPherson had been there. Smith Wigglesworth had been there. Howard Carter had been there. They'd all been there. It was one of the greatest churches in America at that time. And I'd preached there for three nights, and he didn't give me anything. But he was nice. He said, I'll take you to the boat. And I said, thank you, sir. And so he got one of his Bible school students to carry my suitcase and he carried my briefcase, and I carried my hat and my coat. And we started down to the boat there in San Francisco. On the way down, he was a tall, stately, handsome gentleman. And uh, he leaned over a little bit and says, uh, Brother Sumrall, who is sending you around the world? And I said, Jesus. And his face looked as if he had thrown ketchup at him. <laughs> I could tell he got angry. He said, that's all, that's all you young people say. Jesus has nothing to do with it. Oh, wow. oh. Now I saw why I didn't get an offering, you see. He says, I can see you going to China and starving to death. And, 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 and uh, you know, I'm Irishman. And Irishmen don't know when to laugh. They just laugh anytime. <laughs> and that was so funny to me. I laughed on the street. And I said, in that case, brother, uh, would you send a little tombstone over to China? He said, I was going to do this in China. Uh, send a little tombstone over to China. and says, here lies Lester Summerall. He starved to death trusting Jesus. He said, I won't send it. And I said, I won't need it. So it's all right. <laughs> now, that's a bad way to leave America, you know. He was three times my age. He was over 60. He, and, and one of the general presbyters. He asked me, he said, did you ask the brethren in Springfield about this? And I said, well, no. He says, my older brother told me to do it, and the younger brothers don't have any business messing with it. You know? <laughs> Why should I talk to the younger brothers if the older brother says do it? You better just do it, you know? Well, he didn't like that either. Three years later, when I got back, the first place I went was to a general council, and he was the first man I saw. He wrapped his arms around me, and he said, you're the nicest man in the world. He says, I'm so sorry I abused you, didn't give you any money deliberately, and spoke to you so harshly. He says, I didn't know that you were going to do what you have done. Because I had written for various magazines all over the world during that whole time that Brother Carter and I were going around the world together. And so everybody, everybody knew what was going on because we were the only ones moving around the world at that time. And, and so he apologized for it. And I said, that, that's quite all right because, you see, God was testing my faith. When I got to the dock, was he on a shake and tremble? He was helping me shake and tremble. And then say, I only got $12. My God, I can't, I can't, can't stand a good hotel all night. Uh, uh, what am I? 
I didn't think about that at all. I just knew there are millions of people out there and I was going to go get them. And I hadn't stopped getting them yet, but I'm going after them, you see. And, and, and uh, I knew that was th the thing God had called me to do. And, and uh, I went. Now, that's what you call faith. Faith is an act. You don't wait till you got the money for it. You know, faith is an act. When God says do it, how far can you trust Jesus? That is the extent of your faith. How far can you trust him? And when your trust quits, that's the end of your faith right there, you see. But let me tell you what, what, what trust will do. As you're trusting Jesus, you get, number one, you get experience. And in the experience, you get knowledge. And so people can't shake you, you have knowledge. People can't say, hey, this don't work. You got experience. When you've got the real thing called faith, nobody can shake it. It's not possible for them to shake it because it's so bedded on the rock of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ through you know that you know and you're sure that you're sure. Hallelujah. So we went on to Australia and got off. And, and the first meeting we had was in the largest church in Australia, in Brisbane, uh, and, excuse me, in Melbourne. And so I went down and uh, I preached for them a whole week. Sunday through Sunday. And, and uh, in those days, they kept you with the saints. If you take the S off of it, you'll know what you're talking about. Uh, we live with the saints. And, and uh, we preached for a whole week. And, and I noticed that he never mentioned my name except to preach, not in the offering part. And it came Sunday night, and he didn't mention my name. I got no money. Now, I had spent the little I had, and, and uh, I had a meeting the next night about 100 miles away, and I had no money to get there. Now, uh, I cried all night. When you're 20, that's all right, you know, to cry all night. And then I told God, I think God likes this kind of language. I said, God, I want to tell you something. And this is it. I'll die in this room, but I won't leave until the tickets are brought here by you. I will not go on the street and say, ticket, 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 who's got a ticket? I says, I won't do that. I won't go down to the, radio, to, to the railroad and say, anybody got my ticket? Anybody got my? I says, I'll stay in this room. If you can't supply my needs here, you couldn't out there anyway. So I stayed in that room. And the next morning, the, <laughs> the lady of the house knocked on the door, a very gracious person, says, breakfast is ready. I said, I don't want any, thank you. And I stayed in that room with the door locked. I kept telling God, uh, you call me to go around the world and preach. This is the first place. And just like the last place, I didn't get any money. <laughs> I didn't realize it at the time like I do now. Before we got a way off out there, God wanted to be sure. I wouldn't turn back. Yes. And it didn't have one that would quit and go home, you see. And, and so uh, I was there praying. And about an hour after that, the lady of the house knocked on the door again and said, Brother Summerall, there's a gentleman here to see you. I said, well, open, open, open. tell him to come in. So I opened the door. Now, now, let me tell you what faith is. When I got up that morning, I, I, I showered and, and I dressed. I packed my suitcase. I packed my briefcase, which was a big one. And uh, I put it by the door, and I laid my coat on it and my hat on it, and I said, uh, God, for your information, any time you bring the tickets, I'm ready. <laughs> you know what you'd have done? It would have taken you an hour after the tickets arrived, you'd have still missed the plane, uh, the train. Are you here? You do your part first but before God does his. And if you're not willing to do your part, God's not willing to do his part. Is that all right? Here stood this Australian good big man with tears running down his face. I said, oh, dear God, I got enough trouble without you. <laughs> he said, I, I couldn't sleep last night. Well, I says, I didn't either. What's wrong with you? <laughs> he says, if God don't uh, reveal this ring right, I won't ever have any faith. I said, I wouldn't either. What are you talking about? I thought him and his wife had had a quarrel or something. 
He says, now, we all know that you're rich. I have more opportunities to laugh than any little man you've ever seen in your life, you know. I didn't have a dollar. 10,000 miles from home. And then I realized that Brother Greenwood hadn't given me any money because it got circulated that I was very rich. Now, 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 you know, it's a great asset to you if you can look rich when you're poor. You can borrow money on your face. I bought a TV station that way. Yeah. He said, I like to do business with a prosperous man. And I saw him look at me up and down. I said, thank you, sir. We signed for over a million dollars and I didn't have 10,000 in the world. I said, what's wrong with you, sir? He said, now we all know you're rich in our church here. Did you know when people tell me I'm rich, it makes me feel so good, I don't say anything about it. Yeah, it's a good feeling. You can't spend it, but it's a good feeling. It'll make you younger, you know. Yeah. But he said, God woke me up and said, you don't understand that, that this American doesn't understand our, our train system. It says, to go where you're going today, you have to have a reserved place on that train. It's a reserved train. You don't just go buy a ticket and get on it. And it also, besides being a reserved train, it's a reserved seat. You get seat number 12 and coach number 14. And it says, you have to have two tickets to ride that train. I said, I've never heard of it in my life. I don't know even know what you're talking about. But he says, God told me to go and buy those tickets. That's the reason I said, if this don't work, I'd never trust God again. Because we know you're rich. But you don't know our train system. And so I went and got two tickets and here they are. I said, thank God. Hallelujah, the Lord God. Omnipotent reign it, you know. Yes. He grabbed my suitcase and I grabbed my briefcase and two of the happiest men in the world. <laughs> when we said goodbye at that train station, brother, we were flapping <laughs> both, both wings at each other, you know. You say, why? Well, he had heard from God. I didn't have any ticket. I'd heard from God. I said, I'm not leaving this room till the tickets arrive. I'm not going outside this room. You will bring them here or I'll die here. That's what you call resolution. When you trust God like that, he turn hell over for you, you know. When you don't start saying, I'm going to give up, I'm going to quit, I'm going to go home, I'm going to get me a job and make a little money. No, no. You say, bring them in, bring them in. Bring it in and I'm ready. You see. And God said, hey, I like that. That's trust. Trust me to do it. And so we had a great time in Australia. Three months, or four months there. Went on around to Java. Had a great time in Java. Went on into Singapore. Went up to Hong Kong. And the war was on in China. And hundreds of missionaries were in Hong Kong. They had run out of the interior because of the war. And so uh, we had a great I guess you'd call the thing a convention. They had a big hall down on the main street there in Kowloon. And, and uh, the people were there, hundreds of them. Well, Brother Carter has a gift for laying on of hands for the Holy Ghost. So he'd have his meeting over in another area. And i get people saved and healed. I'd have mine in another area. And, and so we were having two meetings a night and having a great move of God in Hong Kong. The missionary that was keeping all of us lived uh, fairly close to the rented church building. And up, he lived up on the second floor. They called it the first floor. Up on the second floor and on the big porch every night, all the missionaries would sit out there, 12, 15, 20 of them, and have a cup of tea. And you know all they talked about? Tibet. Tibet's never had a visitor to come to it. Nobody will dare go to Tibet. He says, would you two men go to Tibet? Brother Carter was a courageous man. He said, yes, we will go. I had 10 cents in the world. Now, Mr. Carter was an Englishman from London. And when we first met, I guess in the first hour, he, said, he was twice, over twice my age. Now, he said, young man, I never discuss finances. I'm a man of faith. 
I never discuss finances. Being an Irishman, I want to say, and you ain't married either. <laughs> but you know, I kept quiet for the time being. He said, as long as we're together, and we preach together, you get half the offering, I get half. If an occasion comes and you can't buy your own ticket, you stay till you can, and I'll go. Or if you can buy your ticket to the next place and I can't, I'll stay and I'll meet you back over there when I get it. So we were two separate entities and, and, and no communist pocketbook or socialist either. And, and uh, being older, he got along a little better. I, I figured I never did find out because we didn't discuss it. But there in Hong Kong, he said, we're going to Tibet. And I said, yeah, <laughs> where are you going? I couldn't make a letter. I only had 10 cents. I couldn't ride the streetcar down, downtown and back. I didn't have anything. And the devil said, you're not going to Tibet. You're going to stay right here. Well, I said, no. The missionary said, that no, nobody's going to Tibet and preach. We're going to go. He says, well, you can't go. You only got 10 cents. Now, if you've got 10 cents, you're not broke. Right. You're bent. <laughs> but you're not broke. That's right. <laughs> And I kept that 10 cents right in my front pocket so I could feel it. It's nice to feel it, you know. <laughs> I kept looking in the mail every day for something from America. God never helps you the way you want him to. It happens to be his business and not yours. That's right. If you're going to say, oh, this one's going to give me money, that'll be the last one to ever give you anything. That's right. You have to let God do what he wants to do. Well, I began to, at my first, that was my first time in the Orient. I was 21 years old now. And I had to get the people saved and then pray for the sick. And, and in both cases, all the Chinese looked alike. Now, now you see, the, the, this was 34 and 35, 1935. And uh, they all wore the same kind of clothes. They weren't colorful in those days. Same, their hair was all black, eyes all black. And most of the women look exactly alike. And after I'd prayed for about two hours, I said, it seems to me like you folks are making a circle. <laughs> and I've already been around two or three times because I couldn't tell the difference in them. <laughs> Brother Carter was getting hundreds of people through to the Holy Ghost and, and missionaries through to the gifts to where they could lay hands on others and they'd receive the gifts of speaking in tongues uh, in the services and interpreting tongues and prophesying. We were having a, 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 a great time, except every night that bunch of missionaries talked about Tibet and Brother Carter was hip, you know? Yeah, we're going to Tibet, yes we are. And, and poor little me said, yeah. <laughs> the devil said, how are you going to go? You don't have a dime, how are you going to go? One night a Chinese lady broke the line we were praying for the sick. She broke the line, came up. She had a servant that had three boxes of canned California fruit. You know, those have about 12, 14 cans in a, in a, in a case, you know, a wooden case. And she had three of those. In those days, it was worth a fortune, you know. They came from California. And this lady said, uh, I, I want to give you some fruit for Tibet. And I could hear the devil roar with laughter. So the servant set it down on the side of the platform and I looked at it and the devil would laugh again. He said, you're going to eat that fruit in Hong Kong. <laughs> said, that fruit's not going to Tibet. You don't have any money to go to Tibet on. You're going to eat that fruit in Hong Kong. And I said, no. Now, if you can't be positive, neither can God. You got to remember that. I said, no, I'm going to eat that fruit in, in, in Tibet. So I took those three wooden cases uh, over to my room and, and I stuck them in the room, a very small room, and there they were by my bed. And the devil seemed to laugh all night about it. Fruit for Tibet, eaten in Hong Kong. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm going to Tibet. He said, you can't go on a dime. You can't get downtown. You can't buy a ticket on the ship that goes across to Hanoi and Haiphong. That little French railroad that goes up through the backside of Indochina, which is now Vietnam, uh, that goes back into Yunnan province in the backside of China. Cost a lot of money to ride it. 
you don't have any. And I didn't know anything about it. I said, yeah. A few nights later, that same little woman broke the line again. She says, may I talk to you a moment? And I said, yes. She says, I'm the one who brought the fruit. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So we're in my room. Uh, she said, uh, I came, my husband is a, is a general in Chiang Kai-shek's army. He says, we are very wealthy people. He sent me down to the British hospital here to get an operation for cancer in my belly. And said, I came and they x-rayed me. He said, yet you're eaten up with cancer. He says, we may operate, we don't know, but you have to build up some strength first. She said, the first night I got out and walked on the street, looked up and, and saw a sign. And the only word on it was healing. She says, I just looked at it and said, healing, healing. Heal means to get better. Healing, getting better. She had never seen anything like it in her life. It was a healing crusade. And, and, and she says, I'll go and see what this is about. And she was one of those little women that made the circle two or three times every night. <laughs> she said, the next day I went back to the hospital and I said, I want you to x-ray me, please. It says, compare it to yesterday's x-ray. It says they did, and the doctors came back in the funniest looking faces. They said, are you the same woman as you yesterday? <laughs> yeah, I'm the same one. I says, that cancer's gone. Glory to God. says, it was all over your belly, inside. It's not there anymore. She said, you sure? I says, well, there's the x-rays if, if you can read them. I says, I came back that night, but I didn't tell you. I just got in the healing line again get healed. So the next day I went back to the hospital and I said, more x-rays, please. And if you got money, they'll make x-rays for you. And, and so uh, she had another x-ray made. The doctor said, see, you had cancer, you don't, and you don't. So are you satisfied now? She came back for prayer the next night to be healed. I asked one woman, I said, woman, didn't I see you here last night getting prayed for? Yeah. Well, did you get healed? Yeah. I said, what you doing up here tonight? Well, I heard you grunted to bed and, and says, I might get sick while you're gone and I'll get this one and I'll use it while you're gone. I said, I, I knew you Chinese were the smartest people in the world. <laughs> I knew that. So she went four, four times and got x-rayed. Finally, the doctor said, don't come back here anymore. He says, we'll put these x-rays in and, and big containers that you can take them back to your husband and he can call in a doctor and you'll see that the thing is gone, that you don't. And they said, you don't have any pain? You don't use any, any medicine? No, no, no pain and, and no medicine. He says, well, you don't have any. He says, we don't know what happened, but we just know that you don't have cancer. And so she said, I was praying and the Lord said, no, you've been blessed by this young American. He says, you, you need to give him the money that you would give to the, uh, uh, that you would give to the doctor and to the hospital. So she said, that seems fair. I'll do that, Lord. And he said, I brought you the money. And it was in one of these little, little, little envelopes, bank envelopes, you know, the little brown ones, you know, not quite white as a regular envelope and go up and down that way. And she, she handed it to me and I said, thank you, madam. You know, Van is a kind of fast moving. I just jammed it in my pocket and kept praying for the sake, you know. So we went ahead and prayed for the sick another hour or two. And then we went over and uh, on that porch where it was real hot, on that porch and all the missionaries talked again. Tibet, so beautiful. Butterflies, that, 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 that wide. Uh, beautiful flowers growing in the trees. Uh, it's, it's so wonderful. It's so, no place on earth is so beautiful as those snow-capped mountains. And uh, Brother Carson said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I had to stay quiet because I had a dime. And so we had tea and we went in. I mean, I went into my bedroom, took off my clothes and put on my pajamas and laid down to bed. And God said, uh, you, you didn't look at that envelope. And I said, no, I didn't. I said, a hundred Hong Kong dollars is not going to help me any. And so I said, I just excuse me, I'm going to sleep. I turned over and God said, you got a, a brown envelope there in your pocket. I said, I'll look at it tomorrow. I don't like to worry all night <laughs> because you don't have enough. Turned over to go to sleep. The Lord said, you, you, got, you, you got an envelope in your pocket. And I said, well, if it'll please you, I'll get up then. <laughs> so 
I got up and turned on the light, went over to the Shifferobe, it's kind of an old fashioned place, Shifferobe, and, and reached in, and, and, and I found that envelope. I said, I'll open it. So I tore it open. You know what it was? It was a $100 bill, American. All right. Did you know I had never had one in my life? <laughs> Brother, in the 1930s, nobody but the banks and the mafia had, <laughs> had $100 bills. Yeah. $1 bills is what went to church. $5 bills went to the grocery store. $10 bills went to the bank for your savings. That's about as high as anybody got. That was money. You could live all day long and eat all day long on a dollar in those days. Of course, you didn't make much money either. But there was a hundred dollar bill. Whew. I didn't know what to do. I'd never had one. We had always used fives and tens and twenties, but I had never had one of those. So I reached in to take everything out. They were all one hundred dollar bills. They had never been used by the public yet. Did you ever smell? <laughs> Did you ever smell new money? Yeah. Smells good, don't it? It's just rotten money that rotten people have used too many times in the beer gooslers that don't smell good. I said, Hurr! how many ever flip money? Yeah. I flipped it. Then I said, I better count it. There were 31 $100 bills. I never had so much money in my life, you know. $3,000. $100 and $100 bills. I got ecstatic. <laughs> I didn't know her name. I couldn't pronounce her name. She was now gone back to her husband, who was a general in the army. And I had fruit for Tibet and money to prove it. <laughs> now, there's only one sad thing. The next morning, when we went down to breakfast, I had a little envelope by my plate and I kept. <laughs> I wanted to talk some bad. I didn't know what to do. But we were under covenant not to discuss money. I wanted to share it. I wanted to say 15 for you and 16 for me. Well, being older, he should get the 16. But we had a covenant that we couldn't talk about money. So I was just. So I spoke up and I said, <clears throat> I'm going down to buy my ticket today. I don't know whether the car is ready for his or not, but I'm going down to buy my ticket today. And, and uh, all those missionaries looked at one another. I was just a kid. I was the youngest one present, you know. We hadn't gotten any offer yet from the local church, which would, would be dividing. And sure enough, I went on down. I bought my ticket across the, across the Gulf of Tonkin into what you call, well, it was French and old China that day, you call it Vietnam today. I bought my ticket on that little narrow gauge rail that went three days journey back into the mountains, Torbo Mountains, into, into southwest China. And, and uh, I went to get one of those things cashed, one of those hundred dollar bills. Well, one dollar American was 2,500 of theirs. So when I went to the bank, I took a big suitcase with me. Empty, cash a hundred dollars, and needed help. Yes. I could could get it all in the suitcase, and finally, <laughs> and, and it was real money, real money. You say, did you live all through China on that? All through Tibet? No, honey. I lived through Russia, Siberia, <laughs> Japan, Korea, and Poland. For that money, I got used up. It was good money. When you only have a dime and you got Jesus, you got it made. God was training me to be a person of faith. And you know what I desire with all my heart? That, 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 that when I die, if I die, it looks kind of, may, may not happen, you know. <laughs> I've been here so many generations already. Uh, 
that if I die, I, I want them to put a little tombstone. And I don't want them to mention that I was a pastor. And I don't want them to mention that I was a missionary. I don't want them to mention that I was an author that wrote books. And I don't want them, want them to, to, to mention that I was, you know, a missionary of any kind. I didn't want them to mention anything about television stations. I only want them to put one little line on there. Here lies Lester Summerall, a man of faith. That's all I want. I'll be quite satisfied. A man of faith. How did it come? It grew like a godly vine. Yours will grow. You know why yours don't grow? You won't work it. You got to keep replanting that seed, you know. And if you don't work it, it won't grow. We own 10 TV stations. Nine of them on the air, and the one in, over in uh, Oklahoma City will be on the air f shortly from now. And uh, God gave them to us, you see. But we had to take them by faith. We didn't have money. We just had to say, hey, I believe. I believe. And that first TV station that I bought, I signed my name to it. And the man we bought it from says, oh, I'd love to do business with prosperous people like you. And I said, thank you, sir. Thank you. It wasn't three weeks before a man in Oregon sent me a check, sent me a check for $125,000. I didn't know him, never did know him. He just in a meeting like this. Another man, another doctor, thank God for the doctors. I wish the lawyers would catch on. <laughs> Another doctor gave me $65,000. And, I, and I, I said, hey, Lord, this is great. The Lord said, no, 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 this is great. You signed your name and my name. I said, I've never gotten money like this before. He said, you never bought a TV station before. Until you're doing more, you don't get more. God's not a waster, you see. And God wants to, I believe, God wants to bless all of us. Amen. My wife and I came home from the Philippines we didn't have a folding chair. We came home in our suitcases. All the work of a lifetime. We'd give it away to others. Churches we built and let the people own them themselves. We didn't have a thing. God says, I'll bless you. And if I were to go through that, you'd, you'd be amazed at, at, at what he did. And we just walked along in, in faith. And he did it. But the Lord spoke to me one day and he said, you know, you've got this thing just a little backwards. And I said, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> he said, no. He says, my word says give, and it should be given unto you. He says, you've been in the baby class all this time. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme. He says, now the richest gifts come when you plant and give, and then I give you more than you planted. Well, I had never had anybody talk like that. Brother Hagin was still a little boy in Texas. He hadn't gotten going with the check. <laughs> I didn't know anything about a thing like that. And, and you know what? The, <laughs> you say, how did this thing get started then? Well, I was crossing the country from, from Chicago and going through Minneapolis, going up into the, into the northwest of our country. And in, in, in Minneapolis, I was preaching in Bible schools. I love Bible schools. And I was preaching in the Bible school there, North Central Bible College, and, 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 uh, for two or three days. And, and uh, I was to go out for lunch with the president, you know. And uh, it was noontime, and I heard him scream at somebody. He said, send them home, send them home. And I'm inquisitive. I said, who are you going to send home? Brother Lindquist says, I got six young men here and they're not paying their bill. Don't look to me like they're trying. And I'm sending them home. And I said, you, you can't do that. They might even backslide and go to hell because you sent them home. So that's for sure, they'll be ashamed. They get home, they can't hold up their head. They failed, you sent them home. He didn't pay any attention to me. 
So I, I walked into the room where the secretary usually was. She was out to lunch. And I said, God, uh, can't you supply the need for these six young men? God said, sure I can. Well, I said, let's do it. He says, fine. Get your pocketbook out. <laughs> I said, that brand new car of yours parked out in front of the school. Take the title deed, sign your name over to this school, and give them the car before lunch. You get behind me, Satan. <laughs> that car didn't have 3,000 miles on it. I didn't want to give it up. God says, well, you prayed for me to supply their needs. And it says, you can do it. Give them the car. So I got my ownership title out. And I signed it over to the school, walked in there, says, oh, here's a new car out in front. Uh, it's a pretty color. It's bright red. I don't like dull colors. <laughs> and and uh, I said, uh, God told me to give it. You sell it, pay their way through school, but don't ever tell them who did it, because it sure wasn't me. I wanted to keep that car. <laughs> So I, he accepted it very joyfully and, and, and went ahead and sold the car and paid six young men through to Bible college. But I got on that old Great Northern Express train the next morning. Remember those old, those old engines, you know? Who they were so big. And when I got on it and sat down in the third class, I heard them start to choo 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 choo. And it didn't choo choo, it said, you're a fool, you're a fool, you're a fool. <laughs> I said, oh, 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 oh. I said, no, I'm not a fool. And I wish they could have started it with one chug, but they never could do it. So he said, chug, 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 chug. And, and the devil was saying, you're a fool, you're a fool, you're a fool. And I said, no, no. I went on out west and then went into Alaska and raised up three churches. And they're still the three best churches in Alaska. And, and, and Ketchikan and and uh, Anchorage, and, and, and uh, what's the town up above there? Fairbanks. Fairbanks. And, and so I uh, stayed up there, went up in September, and stayed all through the winter months until the next spring, and, and had a great time preaching. Came back, and they, the war was on. There wasn't a single company in America making, making a car. Not one. They were all making tanks, <laughs> machine guns. There were no cars except secondhand ones, and they were very expensive because there were no cars being made. So I preached along until I got over to Detroit, and Bon Bowman, a very close friend of mine, uh, pastored there. And so I stayed at his home, and he said, uh, How you doing, Lester? And I said, Doing fine. Just came back out of Alaska, had a good time. Uh, he, he says, uh, Doing all right? And I said, Oh, yeah, doing all right. I didn't even tell him about the car. And I said, Mr. Gooch over here at the American Motors is a friend of mine. He's a Baptist, but uh, he likes to hear me preach on prophecy. And I just came out of Germany and Russia, so let, let me get a hold of him. So he, he called over there for Gooch, and, and uh, I talked to him, said, you, uh, you uh, got any cars? Oh, he said, no, we're making tanks over here. And I and, uh, said, you mean you don't have any at all? And he said, well, out on the yard out there, where they usually have, you know, 10 or 15,000, he says, there are two or 300 sitting out there smut on them so deep like, like that because of the, the filth around this factory here. And, and uh, he says, do you have a car? And I said, no, I don't, I don't have a car, no. He said, let me talk to Bowman. So he talked to the pastor, and the pastor hung up the phone and said, let's ride over and see Gooch. Well, it's the middle of the afternoon. I said, all right. So we got in his car, and, and he lived on the five-mile road there. And, and Detroit, and the, and the factory's over on the Eight Mile Road. So we went buzzing over to the Eight Mile Road, and, and he had the big steel fence open. So we drove right in, and out in the middle of that vast yard where they used to keep cars was a little glass cubicle, and this big fat man was in there, Gooch. And so I walked in. He, he just always loved me. Every time I'd come to Detroit, he'd come over and listen to me preach, even though he was a Baptist. And, and I, he, he, he hugged me and said, how are you getting along? I said, fine, fine. He says, you don't have a car. And I said, I never did tell him that I'd give mine away. I said, no, I don't have a car. I just came back from Alaska. I don't, I don't have a car. And, and uh, he says, uh, take this rag. And he gave me a big old dirty rag about that big. 
says, go out there and smudge around, see if there's any color you might like. And I said, oh, what good would that do? Oh, he says, it won't hurt you. Go do it. So I went out there and I took up the gold dirty rag and smudged around. That one was black. I said, I don't, I won't take that one off. <laughs> Another one, it was gray. Oh, no, I don't want that one. Another one, blue. I said, no. Then I came, then I came uh, uh, <laughs> to my color. Yeah, it was as red as that chair. I said, that's my kind. So I rubbed it a little bit and went walking back over. And I said, yeah, there's a nice one out there, you see. And uh, he reached up and got some keys and fiddled around. And he says, go over and bring it over to me. He says, I want to look at it. And he said, here are the keys. He says, the battery's in it. And so uh, I went over and started the thing and drove it, drove it over to the glass cubicle. By the time I got there, he, he had a white sheet of paper about this long and about that deep. And it says, be sure to get a Michigan State tag uh, license plate within 10 days. Well, I said, Bowman must have bought a car here. And I didn't know that the factory sold cars to people that were not dealers. And, and, and uh, he went out and pasted that thing on the car. Then he fiddled around in the glove box. And he came back. He says, uh, Someone, I really like you. And I said, Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, he says, uh, just get that car and get out of here, would you? I said, do what? You want me to go to jail, do you? I said, I don't own any car. He said, if you look in the glove box, you do. He says, drive on out of here. He says, Bowman and I have a few things to talk about anyway. And I got in a great, big, beautiful four-door car. I gave away a peanut and got a pumpkin. <laughs> hey. You know? This big car, I took it over to a place at, this, at, a, at a filling station where they washed cars. They wouldn't take any money. They wanted to touch my red car. <laughs> and everybody came around and said, Ooh, I said, it's mine. <laughs> yeah, it's mine. So they washed that thing up. I was the only person in town with a new car. And I felt so good about it, the Lord rebuked me. He says, you don't need to feel that way. <laughs> said, if you hadn't have given your car to the Bible school students, I would not have given you this car. He did not do it. I did it through him. Amen. That'll sober you up, you know. And that'll teach you what faith is all about. If you plant, you receive. Now, that's what Jesus said. But you know, some people won't plant. They'll even eat their own seed <laughs> and not even plant it to where you can get a harvest, a harvest from the thing. And I said, isn't that, isn't that something? Isn't that something? Now, I began to live like that after that, that when I want something, rather than asking for it, I give something because I'm planting it for something bigger than I have don't have enough to get what I need, so I give what I got to get what I need. You see? I have a seed, and I have a need. So I plant the seed to receive the need. Are you here? Yeah. It works. It, it works, you see. Now, I wouldn't be able to have television stations today, a shortwave station that's heard all over the world, all over the face of this earth. A few days ago, we read a letter from a man in an American nuclear submarine. He said, you sure sound good down here. <laughs> he said, all the men on this submarine are listening to you. I said, what a letter. And his letterhead was marked for that submarine, American submarine. And they were picking up. He said, we are in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean listening to you every day preach the gospel of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah! I 
But if you don't plant, you can't receive back, you see. A couple of years ago, a man walked into my office, and most of you have heard of him by now, I'm sure. And uh, I, we'd been good friends together, and I'd given him quite a bit of money for his missionary work. And he said, you know, I, I need a truck. Would you buy it for me? I said, yeah, I'll buy it. <laughs> Don't ask me for stuff. I don't have much brains. You know. <laughs> I just give it away. I said, yeah, I'll buy you a truck. I said, how much is it? He says, it's $40,000. That's just for the port where the engine is. You know, that's not the trailer. And, and so it says $40,000. And, and I, I didn't have it. You say, what in the world did you do? You already said you'd give it to him. Well, at that time, we were building our church in South Bend. And I looked over, and we had that amount in the, in the building fund. And so I took all of the building fund and gave it away. How many glad that I didn't have any deacons? <laughs> they have said, the preacher's gone crazy. Let him leave town in a hurry before we give something else away. You know? Yeah. I gave it away. And the devil tormented me. We had to slow the project down. We had to tell the men that we don't have any money for a few weeks just, just, just because we built that thing paying cash. We, the day we completed it, it was all paid for. And, and, and so uh, we, we had to slow the progress down and, and because we'd given our money away. Did you know it wasn't just, just maybe three weeks or four weeks, the telephone rang. And the gentleman on the end says, I'm Dr. So-and-so from another city. Uh, he says, I have a love gift for you. Can I meet you at the TV station? You can always meet me <laughs> at the TV station. I said, yes, sir. So I went over, and he says, the Lord has given me some money, and I watch your television station here. At that time, he wasn't uh, Pentecostal. Uh, uh, says, I, I watch your TV. says, I'd like to take this gift that I have and give it part of it to every, every minister on your station. He said, I just thought that would be so nice. Well, I didn't say a word, you know, best to keep your mouth shut when it's not your money. But he said, God spoke to me and said, I had to give you all of the money, and I didn't want to. I said to my wife, would you pray for two days and tell me what God told you? She said, yes. She, she prayed for two days and also fasted, and, and she came back and said, you won't like what God said. She said, what did God say? He says, God told me that you're supposed to give all of that money to Brother Summerall, and you're not to divide it. And, and so now, she says, we, we have to do it. We have the witness of two. Well, I said, uh, uh, thank you. And he pulled an envelope out and says, it's in this envelope here. I said, may I pray for you? So I, I laid the envelope down and said, God bless this medical doctor. We're so glad that he blesses so many people. And bless him and enrich him in every way that you can. And said, uh, thank you. And he left. He and his wife left. And I, I, did you know we open those envelopes rather quickly these days? <laughs> Don't we, Pastor? I, I opened it up. It was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. And uh, when a when a preacher gets a, a check for one hundred fifty thousand, you know what he does? He says, whoo, 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 whoo. <laughs> He becomes a wild Indian. Woo, <laughs> does he ever? You know, I got so happy, and and, and uh, God said, shut up. I said, it's a, it's a nice gift. He said, I made him do that. He didn't want to do it. He says, if you hadn't have given the missionary the 40,000, I would have never have given you the 150. And all I could think of after that was, uh, if, you, if you lend to the, to, to, if you give to the poor, that you lend to the Lord, and his interest is better than Oklahoma. I believe if God could get into our bosoms, you know, that if you plant, you get back. In fact, uh, I have to do a little planting here tonight, if you don't mind, because I have such a big need 
right out there in front of me such a colossal need that I want to do some planting here tonight. You say, well, how do you want to plant tonight? Ever since I met your wonderful pastor, such a remarkable person he is, uh, I wanted the whole of America to see him and hear him. His words of wisdom are so inspiring. His counsel is, I was noticing as he spoke tonight, is so gracious and so kind. America, not just you bunch in Oklahoma. <laughs> America needs to hear this man. Do you believe that? Well, we've talked to him for several years about this because we just feel like God wants to make him a, a national expression of the love and the power of God. I just believe it with all my heart, you know. I, I don't want to worry him too much, but every time I see him, I keep telling him the same thing. And, and since last year this time, through Brother Oral Roberts, he got that big, beautiful van out there, and he got this beautiful cameras that you're looking at here, and they belong to this church here. I'm really glad for that. Amen. Yeah. And I, I told him, it, it's time now. It, it, it's, it's time now. We can't wait any longer. People will go to hell. People will commit suicide. People will become devastated and lose their faith in God. And we need you, not just in one place. We need you all over this nation. And, and he's ready to do that. He is ready to do that. He's ready. He's been ready all the time. But the moment has come to do it now. And from all my heart, I want us to do something tonight. You say, what do you want us to do? At least for my stations that he's on, I hope he goes on all, all nine of them that are on the air right now. Rod Parsley, I babied him into this television business because we worked with him when he didn't have over about just over 100 people. And, and uh, that good preaching that he got, he got it from me, of course. <laughs> well, me and Norval Hayes. <laughs> Norval gave him the length of it and I put the meat in it. <laughs> we, we love each other extremely well. We were talking to each other just yesterday and we talked together all the time and we just love each other. He's a very, very beautiful brother, but he's making a mark in this country. Everywhere I go, they're talking about Rod Parsley today. A few years ago, they never heard his name. And if he'd have stayed in Columbus, they still wouldn't have known his name. Now we want your pastors to be the same. And I want us to do it tonight. I, our television ministry, Peter did it, I didn't do it, it had anything to do with it. He says he'd like to pay cash for the first year. And Peter took off one third of the total amount for him. And, and uh, he needs about $100,000 because he don't want to go on that TV station begging. He wants to go on that TV station praising God from whom all blessings flow. I'd like to see one of the greatest planting seasons anybody ever saw tonight. And I, I brought my seed to plant along with me tonight. And uh, I have 10, I have 10 $100 uh, checks here. And it's $1,000. And I want to plant that into his television ministry. And I would like for at least 100 people to get up and come down here and let's do it together. And then let me lay hands upon you for prosperity. How many would like to have a better year than you ever had before? I'm ready for it too. The devil's had this stuff long enough. That's right. And, and uh, I'm glad that Kellogg Conflicts gives us about two or three hundred thousand dollars worth of food. I'm glad that the parliament in Sweden gave us six million kroner, which is one million American dollars. We're shaking the devil down everywhere we find him. And if you'll get out there, you can get the resources of the devil, but you can't do it in a rocking chair. And, and, and so 
Let's project this thing out there tonight. Now, I want everyone here, if you don't have your $1,000 tonight, I prepared myself. If you don't have your $1,000 tonight, if you will make a pledge for it and give it as quick as you can. September is a good month to go in the air. To start a month, to start a year in, in September, the kids are just in school, and you start teaching the people, and they just keep being drawn to you. From Hawaii, we've got three stations in Hawaii, uh, clear back into Tulsa and up through Indiana and Denver, Colorado and Wisconsin. Uh, let's, let's get the thing started. Yes. And then, like Rod Parsley, he, he went on to, uh, to, to take all these, the, the stations of Brother Crouch that these, these services are going to. And then from there, he took other independent stations until he is hearing from people today. And he's turning people around. When he yells at them, they understand he means business. He's a yeller. After all, if you come from Kentucky, you ought to be a yeller. You, know, you can't get the pigs in any other way. He still loves me. It's all right. We want 100 people to come down here. And I want you to form a line from way over yonder, clear down yonder, so I can get to you and pray for you. And I want you to say, I'll give $1,000. I'll plan $1,000. Get up and start coming right now from all over this building. And it's, it's a planting season. We're going to get back a hundredfold, you see. We're not going to mess around about it. Just stand right there. The ushers will come and give each one an envelope. Make out your check to this, to this church. And, and if you don't have all your thousands tonight, put in what you do have. Uh, would someone move this pulpit back for us, please, out of the way here? And we need every usher here, down here. That's right. We're going to pray for God to prosper you. We're going to pray for God to help your planting. And, and, and so uh, uh, we want 100 people to get up and come on down here. And, and uh, we want him to go on. I hear to be the first one that I ever heard of that went on television with a year paid in advance. Never heard of it. But it's time he did hear of it. And, and we, we want to see it tonight. Come on, get up. Now, 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 you say, Brother Summer, I don't have that money. I know you don't. You never will have any more if you don't get busy and start doing something for God. You have to plan, you see. God's tired of this gimme business. He wants you to start planning. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said it. Give, and it shall be given unto you. And if you give, it will be given unto you. Now, I've tried it, and I've tested it, and I know it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Uh, Thorpe, count the people and tell me how many we got here. And, and uh, take an envelope, print your name and address. If you can put in your thousand tonight, do it tonight. If you can only give part of it, uh, give part of it tonight. Give something tonight. Uh, to let the brother know we really mean business, that we're not playing games. And let him sit down with the manager of the station over here and say, now we're ready for action. And uh, pick the best time that he wants for himself. And, and, uh, and let's get this thing moving for God. You can't tell. By this time next year, you wouldn't be able to use this part of the building. You have to have it all because they'd be coming from everywhere. They want to come and see their pastor that's been talking to them, teaching them, and loving them. It, it, it's, it'll make a whole difference in your church and in, in your outreach. It, it'll be a, a beautiful thing. It'll be a beautiful thing. Rod Parsons Church seats 5,200, and two or 300 are standing every Sunday morning. Can't even find a place to sit down. And, uh, and, and so... It's time to move with God. God can do it. God can do it. And he's one of the, one of the most giving people you've ever seen in your whole life. Okay, as soon as, as soon as you get through with the envelope, the pastor and I are going to lay hands on them. So if you will, uh, brother, get some buckets. and this, Those that have the, your, your, your envelope all made out, uh, they're going to come by with a bucket. And then I'm going to lay hands on it, the pastor with me. And we're going to pray for harvest. We're going to pray for harvest. Praise God. Now, if, if this line gets full, we're going to make another line and go around by the flowers here somewhere uh, just so I can get to you. Sheila Baha Shaka Bahaya. We're going to tell that poverty devil to get out of your way. Yeah. Now, I want you to know something. When I came back from the mission field, I did not have a thing in the world. And, and, and God began to bless us. God began to bless us. God began to bless us, you know. And it was because we had learned how to plant in Jesus. 
Did someone say something? Okay. Yeah, there's some people I think you're even behind us that God's going to give what they have less amount. Yeah. Yeah. Them, yeah. That's right. You got a lot of offering buckets here? Brethren, you got a lot of offering buckets? Okay. Let's pass them to all the people here. And if you just want to give 500 or 100, uh, you, you put it in the offering bucket and they're going to bring it up and the pastor and I are going to lay hands on it. In Jesus' name. Brother, listen to me. You're going to have, you're, you're going to have riches in heaven because this man's going to get a lot of people saved. I mean, he, he preaches in our camp meeting every year and we know it. Uh, you see, and, and so we just want you to be a part of it in Jesus' name. Just, just put it in the buckets that comes by. And uh, how, anybody need an, uh, a pencil? Would you raise your hand? Or a pen or something to write with? Do you? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell God to bless you and to bless this city in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. When you get, when you get them all, Let's move a little quicker, please. Let's get two, two or three more rushes. Anything that takes over two minutes is too long. And, and so uh, let's yeah, pick up all the envelopes. And, and uh, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Glory to God. Praise God. God bless the people in that side over there. Bless those people, Lord. God bless those people. I command you to be blessed of God. I command sickness to leave your house and your home, and I command poverty to get out and get away and stay gone, and that you think wisely and make wise decisions. Sheila Bakashahaya. Come on, get blessed over there. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Praise God. They're a little slow. Let me have all these. Glory be to God. He's already got them. All right. Praise God forever. Well, hallelujah. Glory be to God in Jesus' name. Bring them down to us when you get through. Uh, uh, Thorpe, how many people we got up here? About, uh, 85. 85. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to start praying for everybody. Don't nobody leave. We're going to have church in a few minutes. Dr. Summerall, uh, yeah. let's yeah. make sure everyone who wants to be a part of this has an envelope up in the congregation. Yeah, that's right. Y'all pass them down the aisles. Yeah. Pass them across. And yeah. I think one thing that's important to remember, you may be here and God's dealt with you with a lesser amount. Yeah. Uh, whatever amount we give to God, God's yeah. going to honor your faith. That's right. And we're going to link our faith with yeah. you to meet yeah. your needs. So take yeah. those right now and begin to prepare them. And then yeah. the ushers will uh, start receiving them in just a moment. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Woo. Ha Glory to God. I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it. How many of you folks are going to give more than 1,000? Would you raise your hand along the line here? You, you, you're not limited yourself to it. You're going to give more. Thank you. Come on. Hey, are there others that are going to go more than 1,000? I had a feeling there was a 5,000 up here. And, and uh, uh, is anyone that the Lord has told you to give five tonight? Would you raise your hand In, anywhere along here? Thank you. God bless you. Beautiful. I, glory to God. I like to see the devil beaten down. Hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. hallelujah. We need just a few more. They're coming. Hallelujah. Oh, the devil don't like this, but God's going to bless you. God's going to bless you. Okay. Now, anybody that, uh, have you taken up the offering back here yet? Ushers? Go ahead, ushers. Receive the offering. Yeah. Uh, we, we want you to bring it up so we can lay our hands on it and bless it. All right, I think we're going to pray for these first, and then you'll have that by then. Uh, let's get it all together. Let's, brother, you come over here. That's all right. Pastor, let's lay hands on it. Ha, ha, ha. Give the heavens a loud noise. Let them hear the word of the Almighty God. Give the winds a mighty voice. Let them hear the word of God. We bless these that plant in the best soil there is and, and the sinners that are out there that don't know God, those that are broken hearted and broken homes. Lord, we're going to penetrate. We're going to go in there. We're going to preach the truth to them. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. In Jesus' name, we command you 
to be blessed, to be blessed in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Oh, Kalabashia. Let, let, let's raise our hands and praise the Lord in Jesus' name. Yeah, Kalabashia. Well, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise God. Okay, 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 okay. So as we take it, praise God. There has never been one who came up with less when he gave to me, saith the Lord, because I am a multiplier, and I will multiply blessings upon your lives. And even if you do not know me this night, as you give unto me, I take attention to it like I did the Roman in the Bible. I heard him when he didn't know who I was. So therefore, if you will give, you will find that I'm watching and caring for you. God, we want you to bless every person in this room tonight. We, yes. we, we, we believe for that. We believe for that. Hallelujah. And these that we're going to lay hands upon. <laughs> Lord, we want the rest of this year to be the best they've ever had in their lives. We want all of earth and heaven to burst forth. And they will have joy. They will have peace. And they will have plenty. Now, Lord, bless them. Bless them. Bless them. Bless them. Yes. Oh, Lord. In Jesus' name. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise God. Praise God. You know, when a person gets saved, they give their life to God. That's right. There are a lot of people that don't want to give themselves to God because they think they're going to give up something. Yeah. So they want to hold on to nothing and lose everything. Yeah. What, what Dr. Summerall has talked about is a way of life. Mm -hmm. Your money, your time, your life, your very being. Mm -hmm. And then if you're here mm -hmm. and you have never surrendered your whole life to God, there are people that mentally agree with the gospel. They say, yes, Jesus did all those things, but yeah. they've never given their lives tonight. Yeah. And I just felt here right now yeah. that you should be challenged. These have made, a, that, that have come a financial commitment in their life, but there are others here yeah. that need to make a commitment of your will to the Lord, yeah. of surrendering your whole self. Yeah. Where you've said, I want it my way. I want to do it. Have control of my life. Mm. And God is saying, if you will give your life to me, mm. I will give you more life than you've ever known. He that keeps his life loses the life of God. Yeah. But he who gives up his life gains all the life that God has. Huh. Bow your heads with me yeah. all over the building. Yes, Lord. Those of you who are here, here who would say, Pastor, I sense God's Spirit is speaking to me. Mm. I've held back on surrendering my will to God, surrendering my life. Mm. You may be here like the prodigal son who thought if he went his own way and did his own thing, mm. he would gain. And he discovered he was only losing. Mm. Today, you want to come back to the Father's house and give your life to the Heavenly Father. Mm. Today's the day to do it. Mm. Maybe you're here and you've been lukewarm mm. and you've not given yourself wholly, mm. totally to God mm. because you've thought in your own way mm. you could have more life. Every day you've lived this way, you've been missing out on the life and blessings God has planned for you. You'd say, Pastor, pray for me. Today is a day of decision for me. I am choosing, I am deciding to surrender my life to God. Pray for me. Every person with heads bowed and eyes closed would say, you're talking to me. Tonight is the night that I am choosing to surrender my life to God. Come back to God and think about it. If you're here and you're not certain you would go to heaven if you died tonight, you'd say, would you pray for me? Or you're here and you want to surrender your life to God. Or come back to the Lord. Or you recognize there are things that aren't right that need to get right. You'd say, pray for me. Pray for me. I'm asking you right now to make a decision and open your heart up to God. And if that's you, Put your hand up in the air and say, pray for me. 
tonight. Yes, sir. Up over here. Up over here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. Over here. Up in the balcony. All right. Right over here. Me too. Hold your hand up high. Up over here in the blue. Tonight is the night. Yes, ma'am. Right down here in front. That I am surrendering my life to God. Are there others? You may be here and say, I, I don't even understand what's happened tonight. I don't know what y'all are talking about. All I know is my life is messed up and I need help. Pray for me too. You put your hand up in the air. God will meet you right where you are. Just hold it up high saying, pray for me. Yes. All right. Yes. Pray for me too. Yes. There are others. I need help. I need a new start. I need God in my life. Every one of you that's lifted your hand and others that want this prayer, stand to your feet real quickly. You in the audience, just stand to your feet real quickly. God bless you. That's it. Quickly, stand up. God bless you. You're ready for this prayer. Yeah. Take a stand. I'm asking believers to stand with them. God bless you. Believers, stand with them. God bless you. I'm going to ask you to come and stand right down here in front, right behind these that are standing here. Come quickly. Let's give them a hand as they're coming, making a decision tonight for God. He's the answer for the world today. Above him there's no one. Jesus is their way. 